So the arrangement I've got here is quite similar to ones that have been described by Alberti, I think was the first. He would have had here, instead of a piece of glass, which wouldn't, in his day wouldn't have been satisfactory, he had a net of, of strings to, to work with and he had a fixed eye point. Dura has a, a sheet of glass which is all squared up and a fixed eye point also. So what I'm going to do here is just to demonstrate how very, very easy it is to fix the perspective. What you need is a single eye point and this is described as uh, usually as the picture plane. So, uh, fortunately, we have Anne Shingleton with us, who is a painter trained in the old school by Simi in Florence, and she's been painting light for 30 years. So I'm going to abandon the driving seat to her. Wire is touching my head, and I'm looking with one eye, and now I'm drawing straight on the mirror the image that I see there. When this is completed, this can be traced and the tracing can then be put onto the... All I'm doing now here is tracing over the drawing that I have taken from the mirror image drawing and um, putting it onto a prepared canvas which has a slight tone put on it, a tone that we think uh, perhaps Lemia would have used. Right, at this point uh, the drawing is on the canvas and uh, the position of all the objects in the image are established and there is the slight colour on the canvas and we think that Vermeer would have done a simple uh, tonal draw underpainting. Here we are now with the painting with a bit of tone on it. Um, I've re-looked at the, the drawing and, and um, made it a bit stronger, filled in various areas that were a little bit difficult to see with the mirror and um, put in the main tones so that the whole picture is beginning to hold together a little bit and I can see where I'm going to prepare me for when I start painting with colour. And I see, see you've got this tone scale. Could you tell us how you use that? This is what I have here put down. I have this white paint here and the black paint and all the different tones in between. And an artist's job is to translate what is they see in light on into paint. And as you see, if I hold this up here, actually, the, the lightest light here, which I would be using, which is white, is actually a darker tone than what I see in, in the mirror. Yeah. And um, that's a difficult thing to do because then you've got to translate all your, all your tones, your, your relationship between one and the other. So the lightest light there would correspond to this, and then I have to go down. So I'll actually put that on here. Um, and I've also put in my darkest dark to help me. And from there I will calculate all the tones in between. Yes. So presumably with a 17th century mirror, it would, there'd be slightly less problem. The, the, I would, it would think it the, would help. The yeah. loss of light yeah. would be much greater. Yeah. Uh, but I can see already here with a, with a modern mirror, there's already a loss of light. So yeah. to use uh, an older mirror, um, uh, it could very well be an aid. It could really yeah. help. Most artists have their, their own ways of doing their palettes, but you have the light colours from one side to the darker, more transparent colours on the other, and you mix your tones together. And as you see, 
um, I've made the turns for the curtain here, the dark part of the curtain, the light part of the curtain. And um, when I'm actually uh, mixing up like this, I can even, here I'm dealing with the, um, the light on the, the wooden furniture behind, I can actually hold it up and judge the colour with my palette knife. I'm, I'm absolutely certain Vermeer would have used a palette knife to mix up his colours and make little piles yeah. of them, and he would have prepared them here. Because what you see here, how you, you can compare one colour with another, and you see it, and this is what will happen on the canvas. At the moment, it doesn't seem to work on the canvas, but it's got to work on the palette first. Yeah, I get you. We've got this piece of pewter to get a little bit closer to what the silver would look like. Yeah, this is amazing. When you hold it up to the and get the same sort of reflection and compare it to what's in a, a modern mirror, yes. you can see that the lights are really toned down. They're much darker. And in fact, your whole tonal range is, is squashed. It's yes. much shorter. You don't, the darks are much lighter too. Okay, and tell us what you feel you've learned from this experience. In the mirror, everything is quite small, and so you yes. can't see it very well. So basically, you just have to paint what you see. And um, this, I think, is what uh, Gowing refers to as the optical way of, of um, representing things. And um, so you end up just painting little wedges of light. Uh, and the wonderful thing about the mirror is that it's all there. You can compare one wedge with another, which makes it much easier to yeah. calculate. The other thing, uh, it's perfectly clear, and even it's clear seeing um, Vermeer's work, is that he was a highly organised man, very scientific, really. Yes, <clears throat> indeed, yes. And um, he must have laid his colours out beautifully and spent a long time working out the colours and the tones on his palette. And then when he put them in, he put them in ta, like that, just beautifully, not yeah. messing around, no, no, no fussing over, no repainting. He knew exactly what he was doing and he, pop, he popped it in. Yes. And since, really, if you get the wedges of light right, well then when the eye looks at a picture, um, it's going to function, it's going to work. Yes, it's, it's going to reconstruct reality right. yeah. um, without yeah. any of the usual mental equipment that uh, uh, Gowing says something very nice about it. Uh, it's difficult to think of any parallel anywhere to his rejection of both the mechanics and the mental background of painterly perception. Yeah. That, that yeah. he's completely uh, ignored what other people have done up till that moment, that That's he's right. looking at light. Yes, he's very pioneering. Yes, absolutely. Yes. When you're trying to judge a set of tones, uh, it's very good to have something dark nearby. And, yeah. and this curtain functions uh, doing that. Oh, really? It, yes. It, uh, and is always there, and, there's, and the um, that you can easily then compare your midtones and your lights to it and, and the intensity of the, the, the hue of the colour, the strength yes. of the colour too. Yes, yes. So that's, yes, the, that's all the interesting have. thing about that curtain is that uh, it apparently such curtains were actually used to cover mirrors. So um, it would have been there with whether he liked it or not. Yeah. Because silver mirrors uh -huh. turn black very quickly, that's I think right. in about three years. Um, if you don't cover them. So when you're using them, you obviously pull back the curtain. When you're not using them, you cover them up. Okay, well I think it's the experiment has gone extremely well. It really does show the result of, of observing in these two mirrors. I particularly feel that, that the portrait of Rembrandt and his collar and blue, it, it's remarkable how very close it's come to, to Vermeer. And uh, I see you've left the, the space where your shoulder was reflected first time in the mirror, and we know that Vermeer filled those areas in. So I'm, I will be painting in there a, um, a 
a piece of material that will cover that and uh, you see that Vumi has done exactly the same. So, yes, uh, yes indeed, there's many examples of that. Mm. I wonder whether he might have even painted that a little bit later, um, even stepping back without the mirror, that, that um, was a possibility. That's a possibility, in picture mm, space. It's very, very much in the foreground. Yes, yes. Um, and often painted in a way to bring it in the foreground, painted simply, and he uses these little dots to kind of give it a texture. He still simplifies. Yeah. He, and he keeps the whole painting in balance. And that is the beauty of his work. So, until someone produces a more Vermeer-like painting from a camera obscura, I think we can take it for granted that this is the way, with two mirrors, that he actually observed the tones. I think that the, his interest in the camera obscura was to see unfocused light. Thank you.